Museum is generally not supposed to have keynote speakers. Everyone here is supposed to be treated as equals, etc., etc., and stuff like that. But if I was forced at gunpoint to the name one of our presenters as the uh, keynote speaker, you know, I probably would have to end up choosing John Rennie as that. Uh, Okay, he's just the keynote speaker under some absurd terrorist situation that I made <laughs> So uh, he is the former uh, editor in chief of Scientific American. He was he was the editor in chief of Scientific American before it became pseudo Scientific American. <laughs> so, I have plenty of letter writers who will argue that point with you, but anyway. <laughs> So, uh, so here is uh, John Rennie uh, going to talk about uh, martial arts, nonsense, and science and such. Lower your expectations. <laughs> I frankly know it's coming and it's not going to be that good. Very good. Very good. And it's, it's, I've been enjoying the morning here and it's great just to be here at the Skeptic Camp, which is of course an event that you know we are all making together, and you in the audience are responsible for what's happening up here as anyone, so if it sucks, that's your fault. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, so, as it says, and as Mitch said, science and nonsense in the martial arts, and I guess a good place to, to start with is asking how many people here do currently or have in the past studied martial arts of some form? I figured actually that quite quite a fair number of people. Okay, so not, uh, and how many people actually actively still, still study? So, okay. Smaller than some, okay, good. Um, that's good to know because if you challenge me, we'll fight that. I'd like to know that. Um, at least you recently fought something. Um, so good. Um, so you know, then you know, not too surprisingly, uh, martial arts can be a wonderful sort of uh, uh, activity to be involved with. It can be great fun recreationally and socially. Um, there are advantages you can get for uh, for self defense training. Some in some cases more than others. Uh, there are lots of benefits that come from martial arts, uh, and especially though when we're talking about the martial arts and we're talking about the ones that are are associated with their their origins in Asia. Traditionally, there's a lot of discussion of those that is bound up with a lot of very mystical, supernatural sorts of concepts. In particular, and surely you know this one, the, the whole notion of the idea of chi or ki, the sort of mystical energy that's supposed to flow through your body along certain kinds of meridians. It's obviously the, the essence of what's, uh, what things like acupuncture uh, and uh, the medical applications of things like qigong or uh, tai chi are, are supposed, to be, uh, supposed to be acting on. And in the cases of the fighting martial arts, the idea is that in theory that you're summoning up that colossal ki, chi energy that you're pulling out of the air and you're focusing it down and doing amazing things with it. And if you actually do see people who are really, really good at martial arts, and I am not putting myself in any way in that company, but if you see people do that, it can be pretty, pretty amazing. I think especially for people who don't have skeptical backgrounds, they can leave some of them sometimes thinking, like, wow, maybe there's something really is something to this whole chi, key idea. But I want to talk about ideas how much that really isn't true. Now, I know you know that is the, the case here. This is probably the, the single room in New York right now that most knows that's not true. Uh, but what I do want to try to, to bring out a little more is what some of the underlying science, and specifically things like the, the physics, the biomechanics, and the like, that lie behind what are some of the kind of astonishing, surprising, counterintuitive things that can be done uh, in the name of, of the martial arts. Um, and because sometimes knowing that does put you in a better position of actually being able to sort of say, that's, here's why, that may be amazing, not exactly in, in the way that you think. So I want to try to actually, there's so much that we could talk about that falls into that heading and no way to cover all of it in the time available. And I'm sure you've got a lot of things you can suggest too. So I want to try to move reasonably quickly through a few ideas and try to show some stuff. And then certainly we can try to get to a discussion of things as fast as possible. And we have a lot of people who want to be out too. Well, that's, that goes without saying. Anyone who asks a question, I, I you know, reserve the right to <laughs> oh, yeah. so, uh, 
useful. So uh, the place I want to start is one of the things is the area of breaking, of karate breaking. I say karate a lot. I'm saying using karate as a stand-in for all different kinds of martial arts in China, Asian, Asian, and elsewhere. And that's not because I have a particular bias of thinking that one is better than the other in those. It's just that's what I am. My, my own background is, is in that, and that's what I just sort of will default to saying almost just by, by reflex. So um, fill in your martial art of choice through, through a lot of that. Um, the, 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 there's an article that appeared back in, strangely enough, Scientific American back in 1979, April 1979, called The Physics of Karate. Um, and uh, it, it's, well, that's what it's first based upon. Um, um, and it, it actually, uh, a couple of uh, years back, it looks more than just a couple of years back, I got interested in, in trying to look into the issue of the physics of the karate beyond my general interest, but because I saw some uh, descriptions of why, what the science behind some kinds of breaking was supposed to be, breaking of boards, breaking of cement slabs, breaking of other things, baseball bats and the like. And I saw a description of it, a supposedly scientific description of it, and I thought, yeah, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right because it didn't correspond to my own experience of, of breaking stuff. Um, specifically, what I was reading was a description that said that uh, you know, what, what martial arts masters do in order to break stuff is that they will hit boards, and the key is that they're not just hitting and following through, but they're hitting and withdrawing very, very fast. And the idea that they're delivering that little bit of energy in a very, very tiny moment, and that that's the key to how they're managing to break these things through. And I have to tell you, that is just exactly the opposite of what I mean, everyone that I know of who has ever been taught to try to break things is ever taught. You are taught to follow through, and you pretty much have to. Now, there, there may be ways, at least theoretically, for some of the reasons that we'll talk about, about why you can actually deliver a lot of force with a you know, very fast, snapping sort of technique, but I'm not sure it's got the kind of penetrating power that would be able to break a lot of deep stuff. That led me to go start looking up what did people know about this, and that's what led me to this uh, Scientific American article from 1989, which is still, it turns out that this article, even though it's, you know, whatever it is, more than 30 years old, is still one of the constantly referenced uh, works of it. It's, it appears that the authors did more research in pulling this together than almost anybody else has uh, since then. So the the basic problem of what, what happens in, in word breaking, and, um, well, this moment when we do this, but well, look, I happen to have a board right here. Um, <laughs> This is a standard sort of board, such as would be used in a lot of breaking demonstrations. It's made of pine. Uh, in this case, the dimensions happen to be that it is uh, 12 inches this way and 10 inches this way. It is uh, officially is listed as an inch thick. If you measured it, um, it's actually more like three quarters of an inch thick, because that's what happens when you get stuff from lumber companies. They actually the measurements of the wood are actually slightly smaller than the, the usual listed sizes. This is very much what somebody who's going to be used to do some sort of breaking demonstration, what they would be using. The traditional thing of what's involved in this is that they, you know, the, this would be sitting all by itself, or different kinds of ways. It would be, for example, sitting on some kind of stand like this, um, with a uh, position up near its edges, um, a little like, like so, or someone would actually be holding it like so. Um, and there could be ones that would be stacked up. And in some cases, they could be stacked up board one on top of the next. In some cases, they could be stacked up with little spacers in between. All of these things affect what's going on. If you see people do this, it can be very impressive because you think, wow, board can be very tough, it can be very hard. There's a lot of physics that's involved, though, in actually driving how this uh, actually is, is coming together. Um, and then what's involved, the key here thing in understanding the, uh, the, the mechanics of this is that you're looking at delivering a lot of force. The force that comes from, depending on the strike that I'm using, from descending, descending hand and forearm, coming down here, the middle of the board, and then that being able to rupture the board. What's happening is that the board, when it gets struck like this, that on the top part of it, it is actually getting uh, compressed, or, and in the bottom part of it, it is actually being stretched and expanded. Uh, and that means that there are different sorts of forces. When a board breaks, it will start breaking on the bottom first, and then that break shoots back up alongside. So there are. This is a physical problem in terms of the actual mechanics and the physics of it. It actually can be very complicated. Um, so most analyses of these things, not too surprisingly, try to simplify it down. But even relatively simple um, presentations of this can show you how some of that stuff uh, can can work quite well. Um, there are 
So you can, um, the, the key thing to understand about that, though, is that you can describe what's involved in, in terms of how much energy you need to deliver to the board to break it according to a mathematical formula that is based on the volume of the wood that's involved and two other factors, one of which is called uh, the, uh, the modulus of rigidity and one of which is called the uh, elasticity modulus. Um, the, uh, the modulus of, of, uh, of rigidity um, is actually is basically, is for all intents and purposes, it's the, it's the stiffness of this. It's the, um, it's the uh, or sorry, actually, the modulus of rigidity is, is effectively um, just how much energy is in this material, how much you need to uh, put into the material itself in order to try to start to rupture the structure of the basic material. And then the elasticity goes to the issue of just how bendable it is, how stiff it might be. So you can break this, provided you provide enough energy into this to overcome those, those, kinds, of, those kinds of factors. And um, what you have at your disposal is the mass of your hand or your foot or your shin uh, and your forearm or whatever else coming down at the, the speeds that are specified and then striking the board and that's delivering this force down and over the space of basically about four milliseconds or typically one sort of board, um, your hand is going from moving somewhere between like four and a half meters per second up to like 15 meters per second, coming down effectively it comes down and stops, goes to zero. And if all of the energy that was in this is delivered to the wood and theoretically should rupture it. Um, so that's the, the basic key and people have done different kinds of studies in trying to... Uh, you know,